Hey, hello, everybody. Um, good to, uh, I guess I don't really see you right now, but it's good to know that there are some people here. Um, so this week um, is the second in this three-week series, and next week we'll be having the final one for this series. Um, just a reminder is next week, because I know Um, and you know it to be the case. Are we not allowed because of the laws of Lush and Hora? Um, are we, or other reasons, are we allowed because it's for their safety? Are we required because of the question of life and death? Um, so we're going to go through some examples of that. That's next week. This week, we're talking about online business on Shabbos. And you're welcome to unmute yourself at any time and to um, ask a question or to say something. But let me give you a bit of an overview that I wrote down. So we know that for centuries, um, observant Jewish salespeople, merchants have displayed really a, a close tie to the laws of the Torah by closing their shops and their factories on Shabbos. They were, uh, people would, would very often could would take a substantial loss by being closed on Shabbos. We know that in the Western world, Saturday is one of the biggest shopping days of the week. And nevertheless, people have often closed their businesses because of the laws of Shabbos. Nowadays, many Jews own what we would call virtual shops, stores that don't have a physical existence. They don't have a building, but they're online businesses where transactions are made without any involvement whatsoever on the part of the, of the merchant, of the owner, or of any employees. They simply put things online and people will buy them or bid on them um, as they please. With and, and the person whose store it is could have absolutely nothing to do with that. And the question therefore arises as to whether these businesses should remain open and operational on Shabbos or must the Jewish owners shut them down before Shabbos begins as they would with their regular stores. Now, just give you an example, you know, most of the places that I've seen, I do not believe actually shut down on Shabbos, but there is one. There's a, um, a photo shop, a very large chain of photo shops in, um, in New York. I forgot the exact name, H&RM, uh, something like that, um, Photoshop. They actually close their website every Friday over Shabbos. They close it during Jewish holidays, um, the entire Jewish holiday, like all of Passover. Um, uh, these, are, these people are Hasidim, and they feel that they're required to do it. While many other people have their own businesses, they have um, eBay auctions, they have businesses on Amazon, and they keep them open. So let's see, which of the two is doing right? Are they both doing right? Are there different ways of looking at it? So we're gonna look at the following things. The issue that we're dealing with here of commercial websites on Shabbos, we can break it down into three questions that we're going to look at. Number one, would profits from transactions that are made on Shabbos fall under the prohibition of what we call schar Shabbos? Schar is making money. Schar is, a person gets schar as reward in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense, it's your pay. A person would go and ask for pay, would be schar. So is this making money on Shabbos um, because you're profiting from a transaction that was done on Shabbos? So is that forbidden? Secondly, even if no money is earned on Shabbos, but an order, somebody made an order, right? But and that was not Jewish. A non-Jew made an order on Shabbos. Would filling that order after Shabbos be considered forbidden as what we call Misa Shabbos, because the non-Jew did an act on Shabbos that you are fulfilling after Shabbos, similar to a non-Jew coming to your house and deciding that um, it was, you forgot to turn the lights on, so he turns the lights on in the house, or you want to save money, and he comes and turns the lights off. That's the same, similar idea. So even if you're not making money on Shabbos, a non-Jew comes and places an order on Shabbos, and you fulfill that order on Monday or Tuesday, 
but the act of, of the, 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 the deal, right, was, was, right, wasn't consummated till after Shabbos, but it was agreed upon on Shabbos. So are we allowed to do that? Thirdly, do online transactions violate what we call the prohibition of Kenyan Shabbos? That is acquiring something, doing a transaction, a business transaction on Shabbos, right? Would that be considered such a case? So if you put something on uh, a business on Amazon and somebody buys your bobblehead that you're selling on Amazon, um, you didn't ask them to buy it on Shabbos, you weren't present, you don't have your computer on, right? It's done all by machine. They go on, they, they buy it, um, uh, right? They, put, they, they press the button, a preset um, com you know, computer program goes in, takes the money from their account, right? It either deposits in your account or it keeps it in, a, in an escrow account and you receive an order to ship. This is done right on Shabbos. Is that allowed or not? So let's look at these issues and go into them a bit. The first thing, let's talk about the one called Schar Shabbos, right, which is making money on Shabbos through a business transaction. The source of this prohibition uh, is a halacha that you find in Gomorrah Baba Metziah. And it's also found in the Shulchan Aruch, coming from the Gomorrah and Baba Metziah. And it concerns the hiring of a watchman, right? A security guard. If a watchman is hired, on a daily basis, right? Every single day, he's hired on Monday for Monday, right? You, you hire him on a daily basis. If he comes on Monday, he's paid on Monday. He doesn't show up on Tuesday, he doesn't get paid for Tuesday, right? His job is a daily job. So if a watchman or a security guard is hired on a daily salary, he can't be paid for Shabbos. But if he receives a weekly or monthly or annual or multi-annual salary, then he can receive actual compensation for, for the entire work period. So the work period, certainly of a year, person makes the contract for a year, certainly there's a Shabbos in that year. And since he's not Jewish, he can choose, we would think he could choose to work on that day. So, but you, I, now if you reverse it where it's your business and he's coming to make use of your business and you are making money on Shabbos, you are making a profit on his actions, are you allowed to do that? So that's really what we're gonna we're looking at here. And the Gomorrah is talking about. So if he's hired on a weekly, monthly, yearly, multi-annual year uh, deal, so he can work on Saturday. But if you hire him on a daily basis, you can't hire him, you can't pay him for working on Saturday. That's not allowed. Now, this could raise lots of issues that we can that we deal with. For instance, how could our show program pay babysitters? to work on Shabbos. They don't work on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. They only work on Shabbos and on Jewish holidays, the days that we're not allowed to pay. And yet I could assure you that, that these people who come in, right, specifically for babysitting, they're very often paid. They, uh, and, and, and most shuls pay them. So how is that possible? We have a janitor who comes into our shul. She's only there on Shabbos, right? We have janitors throughout the week, but she comes on Shabbos. How is that possible that we can have her come just on Shabbos? So there are, this issue comes up, these, what I've just asked you now are a little different than the case that we're dealing with here, um, but it raises the same question. Just to give you an idea as to how it works in our case with how it is that you hire someone to babysit your children, either in a shul for a youth program, or you decide you're going out to a, uh, a, 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 a let's say a Sheva Brachas, or an engagement party, or a gathering on Saturday night that starts at nine o'clock at night, and you've got children who go to sleep at seven. How are you going to do it? So you hire a babysitter. Right? We see it all the time. How is that done? You literally cannot hire a babysitter to work for you on Shabbos, especially you can't do it rabbinically if it's a non-Jew, but Torah law, you can't hire a Jew, and most of the time we do. So how is that possible? So the answer is, is, that, the, is that really the person who you are hiring is being hired um, and are supposed to come to your house before Shabbos and are supposed to see what there it is that's required of them. Like if I'm going to hire a babysitter to come on Friday night at 10, I would say to her, I want you to come over beforehand. I want you to see where we keep the food, where we keep the medication, where the bedroom of the child is, where this is and that is, so that you should know. And we're going to sit and talk about some of the things I'm expecting of you. And you, I want you to tell me certain things that you feel that you can and cannot do 
for your uh, based on what your job is. Um, that conversation, that amount of time that they take, that uh, ability for them to come before Shabbos is really what you're paying them for. And then on Shabbos, you're not paying them. They're being paid for their preparation, for their time. It's Now you might say, well, that seems like a bit of a runaround. So let's understand uh, uh, something that's even bigger and has nothing to do with Shabbos, but it shows you the same issue in a much larger way. And this is when it comes to teaching Torah. According to Jewish law, explicitly in the Shulchan Aruch, you're not allowed, no one is allowed to take money to teach Torah. Because if I, I, I'm not allowed to teach, take money to teach you Torah, because it's your Torah, as much as it's my Torah. And if I'm teaching it to you, I'm basically conveying your own Torah to you. And, and so, so then how do teachers, how does a rabbi, anybody who's, who spends their time teaching, how do they make a living? If they're not allowed to teach you Torah, which is basically the basis of their entire job. A school teacher cannot, teach, cannot be paid for teaching your children Torah. So there it says, in the case of a school, a school child, what you're actually paying them for is their preparation so they should have the knowledge base to do it. And interesting enough, you're paying them to babysit. During the week, you can pay someone to babysit, right? The fact that your child is in school, the purpose of being in school is not to be babysit, but we would be pretty upset if the school did not take responsibility to make sure that somebody was watching the kids, that they weren't running around wild, they weren't getting outside the building, they weren't doing things they shouldn't. So therefore, the teacher is not is not spending his time being paid in order to teach. He's being paid for what they call Zman Batala, the time that he's using that he could have used doing something else. He could have used his time to go study himself. He used his time to open a restaurant. He could use his time to be an accountant. He's choosing to teach your child of which he's watching your child and taking care of them. So that's how they're able to do it. That's a little bit different than we're talking about with Shabbos, but the concept is similar. So let's go on. The Shulchan Aruch stipulates that the security guard may not explicitly request payment for the work that they do on Shabbos. And he has to request payment for the week or the month or the year. So you're either paying him on a monthly basis, a weekly basis, a yearly basis. And Rashi commenting on this piece of Talmud, right, he explains that if the worker is not being paid only for Shabbos, Right, it says nila b'schar sha'ar hayami ve'enu meforish to Shabbos. In other words, he's working on Shabbos, but he's also working on Friday and Wednesday. And you're not paying him, paying him specifically for Shabbos. You're paying him for the week. Then the Shabbos work is absorbed, so to speak, into the wages for the rest of the days, and it's not explicitly being given for Shabbos. So this gives us, in the eyes of the Gemur and the Shulchan Aruch, an understanding that in certain cases you can see that you can have somebody work for you on Shabbos. We've had many examples of this, of people doing things. Sometimes it's because of special circumstances and sometimes that's the law. Let me give you an example of a special circumstance. We've all heard about the expression of Shabbos goy, right? We've all heard this expression and it's not, a, it's not a, a negative at all. It means a non-Jew who comes on Shabbos to do things for you that you can't do. Now you think, how can they do that? I just told you they can't do it. But we all know that non-Jews certainly a hundred years ago would come to the homes of our grandparents or others and they would light the furnace, right? How did people live, right? In the 1930s and before, people didn't have uh, gas and electricity like we have that heated their homes. They had coal furnaces, they had wood burning stoves, they had, depending on where and when this was, Right? They had uh, very finite ways of heating their homes. Then on Friday night before Shabbos would begin, they would pack their, let's say their furnace with wood and light it on fire. And as Shabbos was still going, the, the fire would burn, heat up the house on Friday night. Now you'd go to sleep. You'd wake up in the morning and the fire is certainly out by then. Uh, and, and, it's, and here in Canada, right? And many other places in Europe, it's going to be deathly cold. It could, you could die from the from the lack of heat. So how, so so we always had non-Jews would come into the house, they would light the fire, they would go over to the table, grab whatever it is you paid them, fifty cents, a quarter, a dollar, ten dollars, depending on when it was, and they would take their money and leave after they had lit the furnace. 
How are they allowed to do that? So the law is that they're actually not allowed to do that in general. They are allowed to do it in a specific case, a specific case which has become abused. It had become abused. That was if you had elderly people in the home where it would be dangerous for the elderly po people to get cold. You had children in the home where it would be dangerous for them to get cold. Or if it got so cold in where you lived that it would be literally dangerous for a healthy adult, then you're allowed to have the non-Jew come on their own, light the fire, right? You don't go looking for the non-Jew on Shabbos. This is arranged in advance. They come on their own. They probably would go to many homes in the area. They'd light the fire in your furnace, grab the money that's left on the table from Friday, before Shabbos starts, and they would leave. And that's perfectly acceptable if the case is as I described, where you have senior citizens who could die if there's not enough heat. You have children who could die if there's not enough heat. You have a sick person in the house who could die if there's not enough heat. Or if it's so cold that the normal adult, healthy adult, could die from the, from the lack of heat, then you're allowed to have them come and do it. That's, that's how, how they do it, because there is an extraordinary reason and, and circumstance they're allowed to do the, be the Shabbos Goy. But if it wasn't for that, and this was started to happen after a while, people didn't necessarily understand this. And they started hi hiring non-Jews to come to their house simply because they wanted to be more comfortable. It wasn't warm enough, but they didn't have any children. They didn't have any senior citizens. And it wasn't so cold that they would freeze. So they would, they, but nevertheless, people started abusing this. But by the time it became really bad, of course, the situation changed and you have a thermostat in your house and you have your gas and your electric heat and you have no problem and that ended. But that's really where it comes from. And there are lots of famous people that we've heard of that were, that were, had the role of Shabbos Goy. There's a, a book that says that Elvis Presley did that. Um, there's another book that says Elvis Presley was Jewish. So I hope one of them is wrong. <laughs> yes, that would be a problem. Another one was, um, they, uh, for what was it? He was a secretary of state in the United States, and he wrote a book about it. That he all he he was a black man, and he could speak Yiddish because he, as a child, decided he wanted to do this, and he would make money as a as a teenager, um, being a Shabbos boy, and he learned Yiddish because he came from New York in order to speak to the people. So you have examples of people who did this today. You don't see it as much today. If, for instance, um, the heat would go off in your house. By mistake, of course, you didn't prepare for anyone to come. It would go off by mistake. Let's say the power goes out and the power is back on, but you need to flip a breaker or flip a switch in order to make it work. In such a case where you do have the circumstances, by the way, where somebody could become deathly ill, a child, an elderly person, or the, it's so cold that you could, as a healthy person, could be ill, you would be allowed to go out and find an Anjou and explicitly ask them if they would like to, uh, if they would come to your house and do this for you. Um, you can do this, and there are, many, there are a number of different th reasons that you might be able to, but it's not a free-for-all. For instance, if, you, if your refrigerator light will go on, if you open the refrigerator and all of your Shabbos food is in there, because of the requirement that a person should eat and enjoy themselves through the food on Shabbos, you'd be allowed to ask a non-Jew to open up your refrigerator, knowing the light will go on, ask that non-Jew to turn the light off, so that after that point, you can use it. That's perfectly acceptable um, in those circumstances uh, because the yeah, because by, by you're not opening it, you won't be able to eat. But these are all secondary to our discussion. They have nothing to do with this issue. So now, going back to what Rashi says, right, that the Gomorrah's rule, right, um, about, you know, that he has to <clears throat> get paid for numerous days. He can't just get paid for Shabbos, right? It explains that if the worker is not being paid only for Shabbos, then the, the payment is absorbed into the rest of the week. Like, like he's, paid for, he's paid for the rest of the week. Nevertheless, if he's paid for the rest of the week, even though one of those days is Shabbos, he'd be allowed to do it, as long as it's not explicitly given for Shabbos. So that takes care of the original idea of schar Shabbos. There are many ways a person uh, could make money on Shabbos through a business deal, or things could happen. You could spend money on Shabbos through a business deal if it was prearranged and was done in a certain way, as we explained. Now let's talk about something that's a little bit more directly pertinent to our question, and that's passive income 
on Shabbos. That is, you're making money on Shabbos, but you're not even there, right? You, you know, you have a um, an internet business. You're not present there. Um, you're not dealing with it. Your computer is not on. The internet business takes care of itself, and 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 you have auctions on eBay, and they come to a conclusion on Saturday, and people buy things. Um, that's passive. You have no active role in this at all. You didn't do it. You don't want it to end on Saturday. You would prefer it didn't end on Saturday. You aren't bidding. You aren't negotiating. You aren't describing. You're doing nothing. And nevertheless, you're making money on Shabbos. So clearly, it is forbidden to earn wages for work, as we said before, specifically on Shabbos. So would this apply to what we call a passive income? Is it permissible to earn money over Shabbos without performing any work at all, any forbidden work at all, such as if your, if your website is running without any involvement from you at all. So let's see. According to the Muggin Avram, who is one of the great halachic decisors, right, a great authority of Jewish law, whose, whose commentary is throughout the Shulchan Aruch and is looked at as a very authoritative person, he rules in the case of Jewish money, le money lenders, and yes, there was such a thing, the, the Christians talk about it, it's true, there were Jewish money lenders. While we are not allowed to lend money with interest to other Jews, we are allowed to lend money with interest to non-Jews. Now you might think that's a, a racist or a bigoted way of things, but let's understand what it, when the Torah says that you can't lend money with interest to another Jew, first thing is the question really is why? Let's say I own a business and I have cars. I have 10 cars and you want to come to Toronto and you want to do business. Well, in order for you to do business, you got to get a car to be able to get around. So you come to me to rent a car. I'm going to make a profit on you, right? You're renting my car. I'm making a profit. And he, but nobody says there's anything wrong with that. So why is it wrong if I have money, I have capital and you need money to start your business and you come to me for money and you rent my money and I make money on it. That's forbidden. Why can't you do that when you could do any other type of business with a car, with anything else? What is so bad about, about doing that to another Jew? So the answer is that the Torah is telling us that if a person comes and needs money, rather than help with their business, help with their farm, help with their issues, they literally need cash, then chances are they're in trouble. That's why they need cash. It's not always the case. People want to invest and so forth. But we're talking about here where a person could be in trouble, that they actually need cash. And it says then, if your brother, literally your brother, your sister, your mother or father came to you and they were in so much trouble financially that they needed to borrow cash, they needed some money for, to live, to do whatever it is that they're doing, right? Would you charge them interest? I'll answer the question. No, you wouldn't charge your own parents' interest, your own children' interest, your brothers' or sisters' interest, especially if they're in trouble. If you have the money to lend them, of course you lend it to them, and you tell them, "Pay me back, right? What I lent you. I'm not doing. I don't need you to charge. You know, I don't need to charge you for that because you're my family." So the Torah is telling you, when it comes to something like lending money, every Jew is your family. You, you're related to all of them. So you are not allowed to charge interest. But there's nothing evil about charging interest. It's no different than my renting you a car and making a profit. By renting you my house, a second house. I have a second house. I'm renting you it as an investment. Nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly fine. But money is different. So therefore, I can't charge interest when I deal with a Jew. With a Jew. Um, but I can charge interest when I'm dealing with a non-Jew because they're not my brother or sister. I, by the way, I can't charge an exuberant amount. Exuberant amount. I have to charge a reasonable amount of interest. It has to be within the guidelines. I can't be a loan shark, but I'm allowed to lend money. So now we're gonna talk about these money lenders. So the money in Avram says that in the case of Jewish money lenders who collect interest on their money from non-Jewish borrowers, as I've just explained, they can charge interest on a weekly basis, or a monthly, or a yearly, but they can't charge on a daily basis. They can't say that you know it's going to be, a, a, it's, you know, two percent. Uh, I'm lending you money two percent a year, but I'm charging you on a daily basis. So every day you owe me a bit of money, right? Why? Why not? 
So, so the Magen Avram says, sorry, I just have to read the Magen Avram and translate it while I'm doing it. Um, he's, he says that you can charge interest on a weekly basis instead of a daily basis. In other words, he's saying that if the loan would be repaid in the middle of the week, right, and you're charging them by the week, the lender must either charge interest for the whole week, if you had it on one day, then you have it for all days, or he can't charge at all. But he can't say, I lended you this money, you're supposed to pay by the week, you gave it back to me after three days, pay me for three days. You can't do that and, uh, at all. So that's, that's a, a law in the Shulchan Aruch. It has nothing to do with the laws of Shabbos yet, right? But uh, so again, if a person borrows money and he's charged interest by the week and he only keeps the money for part of a week, even if it's six weeks and then a part of a seventh week, but it's a part of a week. So you have a dilemma. You charge by the week. Either you lose the, that week and you say, all right, you didn't keep it for the whole week. Just give me my money and no interest in this week. Or you charge him for the whole week's interest because it's his choice to give it back now. You, he, your arrangement was to lend it for, borrow it for a week. He gave it back now. Either way, right, you can only charge him for the week. And if the, and if the, and if the lender would charge on a daily basis, according to the Muggin of Raham, he would be receiving interest for Shabbos, which is forbidden. If you charge for the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and one of those days is Saturday is Shabbos, nevertheless, you're charging for the week. Shabbos is just folded into it. If you're charging by the day, even if it turns out to be the same amount of money, right, then Shabbos is independent. Thursday you charge for, Friday you charge for, Saturday you charge for, Sunday you charge for. Each day is independent of the other. Now you're charging money specifically on Shabbos. And the Muggen Avram says, this is forbidden. According to his opinion, you can't do this. And his source is a, a, a very interesting source. Um, and we have, to take, we have to take the story with a little bit of tolerance, but, we'll, but, but it's an interesting way he looks at it. And here's what he says. I'm going to, again, translate as we go through it. So he says, a source, that there's a Gomorrah in Ksuvus that talks about a moredes um, or a moraid. What is that? That's either a husband or a wife who rebel. They're rebelling against Judaism. Let's say you have a man, uh, a man and a woman get married, and they're married as observant Jews. And after the second year, the woman decides she doesn't want to be religious anymore. She rebels against Judaism. Or the man decides he doesn't want to keep religion anymore. He's going to not keep Shabbos, not keep kosher, nothing. He's giving it up. He's moraid, right? He is rebelling. So a husband or a wife who rebels against the other by, right? So by refusing to do numerous things, one of the other things it could be is intimate relations. Right. There is an expectation between a husband and wife that there is intimate relations. Let's say one of them says, I'm not having relations with you anymore. I'm not doing it. I married you. I'm not having relations anymore. So the Mishnah gives a statement. It says that a wife who rebels in this manner forfeits a certain amount of the value of her kasuba for each week that she rebels. And conversely, if the case of a husband who rebels, and he is the one who says he won't do it, the value of the wife's ksuba is increased every week. So let's say a man and woman get married, and he promises her that if we get divorced, right, I will give you a thousand pieces of silver. Now, you have to understand what the ksuba is. It's a, it's a very interesting point. Some of you don't, you know, I, I, I'm not looking to teach you something you already know or to presume you don't know. But there, it's an important thing to realize. Originally in marriage, there was no such thing as a ksuba. A man and a woman got married. For any reason, they got divorced. The husband would divorce the wife and she was out on the street with nothing, nothing, no money, no nothing. And you could imagine that in ancient times, women were, even though Jewish women were better educated than any women of the world, they, were, they certainly were not able to make a living They'd be here, they'd have no place to live. They'd have the children to take care of. They would be on their own and they would have no money. And along came the rabbis and they said, this act of men throwing women out and divorcing them is wrong. We can't allow that. Divorce is a real thing. There's nothing wrong with divorce. If it's necessary, it's necessary. But you can't take a woman and destroy her. You are required to pay her. 
Yes, the Torah allows you to divorce her. So you want to divorce her? It's going to cost you a thousand pieces of silver, maybe two or three, depending on your agreement. Right? You can imagine today a thousand pieces of silver is worth real money. Right? It's not nothing. It's a lot of money. And, and therefore, a person has to, to do that. So here you have a very interesting point. In the world, non-Jewish people in the world were divorcing their wives and the women were wandering the streets. Like you can see this in Dickens. If you, if you read Dickens, in, in, it talks about it, or is even in some areas of, of Victor Hugo, they talk about it in the literature from those eras that the women were destitute on the streets because their husbands would throw them out with nothing. The rabbis came along and said, you can't do this. This is not how you treat a Jewish woman. Right? That's how the world might do it, but we're not going to allow it. So they built into the marriage this, this contract called Aksuba. So don't misunderstand it. Aksuba is not a document of love. Aksuba is a business arrangement made at the wedding right, when, when you have no reason to believe there's going to be a divorce. But just in case there is, this is, this is bound. The husband is bound by this. No woman should get married without Aksuba, even today. And today, Right? The law is that a woman should always know where her ksuba is. Right? It was traditional. Women used to hide their ksubas so that the husbands wouldn't know it because if the husband wanted to divorce her, he'd, hide, he'd take the ksuba and steal it and say, I never gave her ksuba. Prove it. Right? Today, no rabbi will marry a woman, will allow a woman to get married. Like Somebody comes to me, they want to get married. I would never allow them to get married without a ksuba. It's not even a question. Right? Right? Maybe, a, maybe a prenup, but definitely... They have to have a ksuba as an integral part of it, right? But because of it, the women are supposed to know where it is at all times, just in case if it suddenly disappears, you know something's up. But right? that's the story. That, that's what the ksuba is. So now you've got um, a, a husband who rebels against his wife and he will not have relations with her. So every week that he does that, it says that he has to pay her additional money when they get divorced or if they get divorced, which they probably will if he's acting this way. Or if the wife rebels and she won't be intimate with her husband at all, so then her ksuba is lessened by a certain amount each week. The point here that I want to get at is the week, right? So the Gomorrah distinguishes between the two cases when it comes to regard to Shabbos. It says Shabbos is included in the decrease of the ksuba's value in the case of a woman, but it's not included in the increase in the situation of a man. Why is it? Again, it sounds sexist. No. The reason the Gemara explains is that if the wife were to receive compensation for Shabbos, it would appear as if she's making money on Shabbos. Schar Shabbos. She's making a profit. My husband won't have relations with me this Friday night. He owes me 10% or he owes me 2% because it's one day. And therefore, the rabbis excluded Shabbos when calculating the extra amount owed to the woman on account of her husband's rebelling. Now, the Mugin Avram says that even though the woman does not perform any work on Shabbos, she may not receive comp uh, compensation for that day. And therefore, interest may also not be charged specifically for Shabbos. Right? That's the case that we were originally dealing with. This is his proof for it. As such, interest must be charged on a weekly or monthly basis and not on a daily basis. So here you will see that any Jewish institution, be it a Jewish bank, a Jewish individual, if they are going to lend money with interest, and there are ways of doing that um, that are legitimate, they will always charge either by the week, the month, or the year. They will not allow to charge by the day. Now, we're going, returning to our idea, our idea of commercial websites, it appear that it would be forbidden to receive profits for business conducted on Shabbos, despite the fact that no work is performed, right? We just told you, you are, you, you are collecting interest. I'm not doing anything to collect interest. I, I gave you my money, but I'm not doing anything that I should get interest. And nevertheless, th the law is I have to collect by the week. So I should not be collecting money for Shabbos specifically. In the case of the woman whose husband won't have relations with her, and because of that, her ksuba increases every day, right? They will not allow it to increase for, the, for that Shabbos because that's considered like she's making money on Shabbos. Is that not like the websites? I'm not doing anything with the website. I set it up on Wednesday and you, Mr. X comes on Shabbos and he wants to buy 
a widget from me or a car tire or whatever a toaster that I'm selling. I, I'm not involved with it. I don't know he's doing it. I don't know when he's doing it. I don't tell him to do it. I don't answer any questions. He just does it. Still not allowed. That's what it seems like so far. So far in our discussions, it looks like you would not, you would be forced to close your website on Shabbos. You would not be allowed to have an eBay auction with a buy it now that would allow you to buy it on Shabbos <clears throat> or an eBay auction that would end on Shabbos or an Amazon business where somebody could go onto Amazon and buy something from you on Shabbos. You wouldn't be allowed to do any of that. So we'll move forward. Now, how about payment for merchandise? We said in the beginning. So an important distinction exists in this between different kinds of commercial websites. When dealing with the sale of merchandise, there is a strong halachic basis to allow receiving payment for sales made on Shabbos when payments, excuse me, when payment for online information or games played online would be forbidden. That is, somebody can go on their own and buy something on Shabbos, but if they ask me a question or they want me to teach them how to do it, then it would be forbidden. Let's explain. So the source for this is, is found in a, in a comment, one of the great halachic authorities known as the Noda Yehuda. He was a, a bit more recent than the Magin Avram. And, he, and, and this comes from the fact that he permitted people who owned a mikvah to receive payment for the use of the mikvah on Shabbos. Let's say um, either a woman needs to go to the mikvah on a Friday night, or a man chooses every Saturday morning to go to the mikvah. Now, some, somebody owns this mikvah. Remember, we're not talking about today. Let's look at it where it's much simpler. In order to have a mikvah, you have to have water. In order to ha have water, you certainly don't want to have frozen water. You want to have warm water. So somebody's got to pay for the woods, light the fire, you know, make sure that the, the place is heated, the water is heated, it's clean, it's taken care of. That all costs money. And you do it maybe as a community service, but you want to make money on it. Even synagogues who have mikvahs, they make money on it. If they don't, they stop doing it, right? They have to profit to help run the synagogue and certainly to pay the bills. So the Noda Behuda writes that a mikvah owner is entitled to payment for the firewood that he uses in the mikvah on Shabbos. He also can receive profits um, for having the mikvah open. And in, in establishing this permissibility of getting payment for the firewood, the Nodi Yehuda says, is it possible that one who takes something from his fellow on Shabbos does not have to pay for it, him for it during the week? Like, what if you come to my house and, and I have um, an, a, a, a bottle of aspirin and you need aspirin, right? And, you're, and let's say you're allowed to take the aspirin on Shabbos and you need it, you right? Am I required just to give it to you for free and take a loss? No, of course not. I can't be opening a business to sell it on Shabbos. But if you come to the house and take it, it's perfectly reasonable for you to come after Shabbos and re replace it or pay for it, right? So it's obvious to the note of the Yehuda that if a person takes someone else's possession on Shabbos, he has to pay for it after Shabbos. And, it doesn't con and that does not constitute Shabbos, Shabbos, making money on Shabbos. Why? He says, the halacha distinguishes between payment for services, which is forbidden if the services are provided on Shabbos, <clears throat> and payments for merchandise, which is permitted even if the merchandise was acquired on Shabbos. Here he shows a difference between that. If it's a service that you're purchasing, you're purchasing my doing something for you, my right, some type of a service, that is forbidden. But if, but it, all right, and it's, uh, it's, it is forbidden for me to make money on it. It's forbidden for you to buy the service on Shabbos, but let's say you did, let's say you're not Jewish and you did it. Or a non-Jew who comes and, and, and go, uses my Amazon, my Amazon store and buys something from, me, uh, from Shabbos. If he go, goes and he wants me to instruct him how to do it or how to use this object or how to play this game, or he's paying me, like let's say he's paying me like nowadays, you have all these games on the internet. And as you use the games, you have fees that you have to pay, right? Not just for the use, but to be to learn how to use it better, to purchase special weapons or different things for it. That would be forbidden on Shabbos for a non-Jew to do that to my business. 
because he is expecting me to participate by educating him, by, by participating. But if he's simply buying an object and I have nothing to do with it, even though ultimately I'll make a profit, he's allowed to do that. He's the non-Jew can do that and I can benefit from it. Now, now there was a, a rabbi who I, I, mean, I, I met not that long ago, he's no longer living, he was Rabbi Yitzchak Weiss, known as the Minchas Yitzchak. He's one of the great rabbis of the, the, the really the big based in the court in Jerusalem. Excuse me. He quotes this note of Yehuda when he talks about the question of automatic vending machines. I was asked this question in Shabbos. Having an automatic vending machine that operates on Shabbos. Let's say you have a vending machine today, you don't have them as much, but you had a vending machine that sold cigarettes or sold candy. And you're in the vending machine business. Do you have to actually close down your vending machines on Shabbos because you shouldn't make a profit? It's in the airport, right? You, uh, you have the contract in the airport that you can have <coughs> your vending machines there. Do you have to either not ha take that contract because they're gonna be open on Shabbos or close them on Shabbos? So he says that in light of the opinion of this Nota Behuda, <coughs> excuse me, Nota Behuda, he comments that one may receive profits from the purchases made by non-Jews from his vending machines on Shabbos, as the payment is made for merchandise, not for services. Similarly, a person can receive payment for merchandise that's sold online over Shabbos, whereas payment for online services provided over Shabbos would be forbidden. That would be considered shkar Shabbos. Now, I, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit because there are a few things that, that I would like to talk about, but we're, we're, we don't have much time for it. Now, let's talk about the next section, which is called indirect benefit, right? We have to consider um, that, that a person might make an order to be processed for a reason other than just a simple reason. What is it could be? The person might benefit, the benefit the person derives from this work is not direct. In other words, the merchant earns profit as a result of the order, but he doesn't derive direct benefit from the order itself. We can compare the situation to what the Mishnah Burris says somewhere, where he talks about if a Jew himself cooks food on Shabbos, now it's forbidden to cook food on Shabbos. A Jew goes and cooks food on Shabbos, and therefore he can't eat the food um, ever. He can't eat the food ever. If a Jew goes knowingly, willfully, and breaks Shabbos, right? He knows what he's doing. In other words, it's not a person who doesn't understand Shabbos. They're not religious. They're not educated. A person is rebelling. He's a, an observant Jew, educated observant Jew. And then he decides, I'm going to do this. For whatever reason, he's going to cook on Shabbos, right? And there's a penalty. The penalty is that he's never allowed to eat that food. That food is forbidden for him forever. If now, if it was a non-Jew doing it, if a non-Jew comes into my house and, and I say to him, hey, listen, Ivan, come over here and do me a favor, cook me a steak. I can't do it at Shabbos, but cook me a steak, will you? Right? The non-Jew does it. And not only am I not allowed to eat it on Shabbos, I have to wait the amount of time after Shabbos that it would take him to cook it before I could eat it. So it would have to be that as if he waited till the end of Shabbos to cook it, and then I could eat it. So even though he cooked it on Shabbos, but that's the penalty. Now, in the case of the Jew that I just told you, he never can eat it, right? But in the case of a non-Jew doing it, I can eat it after Shabbos, but I have to wait the amount of time it would take, right? As I said, so, uh, so in such a case, you can sell the food and he would use the money. Using the money received in exchange for the food constitutes indirect benefit from this work. So here it would be a little bit different. However, we can go into this in many different ways. So let's just look at an opinion from Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Auerbach. Rabbi Auerbach was someone that I also met a number of times. He lived until the 80s. Um, he was an extraordinary figure. He, was, he had the largest funeral in the history of modern Israel because he was beloved by religious people, non-religious people, uh, Jews, even Arabs who knew him. He was a very beloved person. He had the largest funeral. So in one of his letters of Jewish law, he, write, he, he writes that although one would be allowed to use a key to open a door, what happens if the following happens? Let's say that um, 
a person has a house and they left their key somewhere. They left their key in shul. And there's no Arab, so you're not allowed to carry, right? You understand where here in Toronto, we have an Arab. It allows us to carry within the Arab th things that we need, like a key. So we can open it. But let's say there is no Arab. Let's say the Arab went down. It's not working. And I let my key is left at the shul, right? I left it at the shul. I go and I get someone to bring me the key on Shabbos, right? So I would be having direct, direct effect for me on him bringing that key. So the question is, what's the penalty? I just told you about the penalties. What's the penalty? The guys, the guy, I get a Jew to bring me a key on Shabbos in order to open the door of my house. Now, is he affecting my house? No, not affecting my house, right? So is he, um, what is the purpose of the key? The key is to open the door. So maybe it should be that he can't open the door or maybe he can open the door, but I can't go in. Like, what can we do? So he's, the Rabbi Auerbach says that although one would be allowed to use the key to open the door, as this would constitute direct benefit from the work, um, excuse me, one would not be allowed, I'm reading it too fast, he would not be allowed to open the door because that would be direct work, right? Directly gaining from the work of somebody carrying the key for, in a forbidden way on Shabbos. But if someone did open the door, I didn't ask them to. They showed up with my key and they opened the door. They broke Shabbos, but they opened, They came and they opened the door. I'd be allowed to enter and use the house. And he says that the prohibition of what he calls Maisa Shabbos and a forbidden act on Shabbos forbids deriving benefit from the object with which the, the, the malacha, the work was performed, which is the case of the key. How, therefore, it would be forbidden to make use of the key Right? In other words, somebody brings me a key on Shabbos, he can't hand me the key and I use it, I'm not allowed. But what if a, a non-Jew comes with the key and he opens the door? Am I allowed to go inside? So he says, yes. All right? That does not consider to be a, a forbidden act of work. Therefore, you can der derive benefit from the door and from the home as if they weren't involved. The act of carrying the key was the forbidden act. Uh, but, but the non-Jew opening the door is not forbidden. So he therefore, um, is, he, he, he takes his position, right, that, that in the case of a key to open a building or to open a door, right, he says the object of the malacha, of the, uh, the object of the forbidden act is the key, not the door. And therefore, once the door is open, you're allowed to go in. Now, watch how this plays out. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who also I had the honor to get to meet a few times, um, was the, really the greatest rabbi in Jewish law of our life, of, of our modern history. He forbid entering a building if the key was brought in violation of Shabbos. He says that if somebody brings you a key on Shabbos, you can't go into the building. And he says the premise of this is because it's a forbidden act of Shabbos. He says, now it applies to the object regarding what the work was as performed. And he says that would include entering the building. Right. The first opinion is no, the, the act that's wrong is bringing the key. Nothing wrong with opening the door. Opening the door is not a forbidden act. If I have a key on Shabbos that's, that I keep under the mat in front of my door, so I'm not carrying it on Shabbos, I can pick it up and unlock the door perfectly fine. Right. But if somebody brought the key, so according to the first opinion we said, that it's wrong to bring the key but it's not wrong to open the door so you can do it. Rabbi Feinstein says, no, they're directly related. You can't bring the key, you can't open the door because you wouldn't be able to open the door without the key. You only can get the key because he did it something wrong. This is a similar idea I get with people sometimes where they ask me if, if one of their friends or a family member who doesn't really understand the laws of Shabbos that well comes to their house on Shabbos and, um, and they drive. You didn't specifically invite them to come. You didn't ask them to come on Shabbos and drive. They did it. They showed up. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Voila, there's your cousin, Ernie. We, right? And he brought you a cake. Right? Are you allowed to eat that cake? So Rabbi Shlomo Zama would say, yeah, there's nothing forbidden about the cake. Right? The act of bringing it to your house is forbidden. But the fact that the cake is there, nothing wrong with it. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein would say, you can't eat the cake. Because you wouldn't have had the cake in the first place had he not broken Shabbos. Right, so you see how that works. So in any event, we now have two different models to look at when it comes to the laws of indirect benefit. Selling food that was cooked on Shabbos, as we mentioned, right, which the Mishra Bura permits, 
as using the money does not constitute direct benefit, he says, from, the, from breaking of Shabbos. And then we have the other case of using a key that was um, accessed by breaking Shabbos, um, right? But he would, but we would say that you'd be able to enter your home or not enter your home, depending on who you follow. But there was, but the key opened it. The, is the opening of the key considered a violation or not? So Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says it is. Rabbi Auerbach says it's not. So therefore, we have the question then it becomes that based on these two examples we would compare processing orders on Shabbos in the following way. On the one hand, a person could argue that the order itself, right, uh, the order merely facilitates a profit. One derives benefit from the money, not from the order itself. As such, the situation, let's see how I can say this, the situation would resemble the case of selling the food that had been cooked on Shabbos. On the other hand, you might argue that the merchant uses the orders in um, the way that he uses a key, right? You, in other words, the act that the person did of buying your stuff on Shabbos, right, is not forbidden for him. He's not Jewish, <laughs> or if he may be Jewish, but it's not forbidden. It, it's but but it's not forbidden for you if he is Jewish. It's forbidden for him to buy it. It's not you didn't present it to him. It does it on its own. So he's saying that that's like the key. The key is brought in a forbidden act. Somebody went and bought something on Chavez. Now the key is not forbidden, it's a key. And it opens your door, right? Nothing wrong with opening a door on Chavez. So now the act of buying it on Chavez is forbidden, but is the result of it forbidden? So here the commentaries are telling you there is no indirect forbidden act and it would be permissible, right? Now, Another factor that we have to consider, and then we're going to have to come to a conclusion. Um, whether, hey, Rabbi. Yeah. Uh, how was how was the graduation? Are you talking to me? All right, I think somebody's got to get muted. Okay. All right. Another factor to consider is whether we view the customer's act, his work that he does, the forbidden act, as having been done. For this, for the owner. In other words, I own the I own the website, and and a person comes, and a customer comes, and he buys something from the website. So is it like that he's now part of part? Of, in other words, do we consider the customer's work being done for me? Right? Is he doing it for me? In other words, I set it up that it was like dominoes. You push the first domino and it causes 500 to go. I don't know if any of you are old enough to know who Rube Goldberg was. I'm not old enough to know who he was, but my father was and he used to tell me about him. Rube Goldberg was this Jewish guy, was an engineer and you'll know his work. He used to make these cartoons about crazy things that you could do that would have a very simple result. Like a guy would uh, have a mouse and he would cause the mouse to run after a piece of cheese, which a rope was hand attached to the cheese. So when the mouse would take the cheese, it would pull the rope. It would cause, it would cause the door of the room to close. On top of the door would be um, a bucket. The bucket would fall over and water would fall out of the bucket. The water on the floor would spread and it would cause something else until the end result is it would push down the lever on your toaster and you would have toast. You would have the 55 different things going on to have toast, right? All of these actions, oh, Rube Goldberg used to make these very interesting things. He, he made a mouse trap that way. It was all a cartoon or how to make toast. He would make your bed. It would take like 50 things, including a trained cat to be able to make your bed, right? That, that you wouldn't have to make your bed yourself. So is that what you're doing when you set up a website for Shabbos? Are you setting up everything like a Rube Goldberg so that the last step is the guy comes to buy it and everything falls into place that you did, you yourself did it. You made it so that as soon as that guy buys something, boom, 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 boom. It charges his credit card. It puts it into your bank account. It's your money. Is that what's going on? And therefore, is he actually, by doing that act, actually working for you? It's a, you're not paying him to do it, but is he actually working for you? As if he came into your store, he bought something, the guy in the store takes his credit card and charges him. Here, he's doing the act, but you set it up, right? So 
one could argue that a customer placing an order does so because he wants to obtain the item, not to benefit the owner. He's not doing it because he wants the owner to make money. He wants the object. Although he knowingly benefits the owner by giving the owner business, his primary intent is to acquire something. He wants the object. He's not looking to provide a service for the owner, right? So that he says, however, you can question this. And the other way, the Shulchan Or has a ruling concerning the sale of merchandise to someone from whom one had vowed that they would never get benefit from, right? So I, I, I make a vow to God, I, I swear to God, I, I make such an oath, Mr. X, I don't want anything from that guy. And that guy can't, I don't want to benefit from that guy at all. Nothing, no matter who, what he does, I, if he wants to give me money, I'm not taking it. I want nothing to do with this guy, right? So he says, you have a case here of a sale of merchandise to someone who you vowed you would not get any benefit from. And the Shulchan Orech says that assuming that we are dealing with a regular transaction in which the sale price is fair and therefore both people are getting a gaining, the guy buying it is gaining and the guy selling it is gaining. As such, right, even if you said I would not derive benefit from the other person, right, and I, I may not buy, I might, I may not buy it or sell to him, I, I'm deriving benefit, you might say in any case that because you're both equally getting benefit, you're not really, he's not working for you, right, you don't really get that benefit. So therefore, we would not say that if you set up a system where a person comes on and they push the button to buy your object, that they're actually doing it on your behalf. No, they're doing it because they don't have an interest in you making money. They have an interest in getting that object and therefore they, they're doing this for themselves, right? So th that gives you pretty much the, the next piece. So let's tie it up a bit, okay? So in conclusion, right? Because we're down to our last three minutes. When it comes to Schar Shabbos, making money on Shabbos, as long as one is selling merchandise as opposed to providing an online service, right? Like educating someone of something, um, you know, giving them something for in order to add to their game, to educate them more, right? If you are just doing merchandise, you may receive profits for sales made on Shabbos. On the basis of what we read from the Nota Yehuda, the first, the second one, right? First was Mug and Avram, then the Nota Yehuda, who says that he, you could allow payment for items that were taken on Shabbos, right? If somebody walks into your house and they take something from your house on Shabbos because they needed it, right? They needed that. You, you can't expect that they can take it for free. They can come back and pay you later for it. That's perfectly fine. So Shachar Shabbos, making money on Shabbos is not an issue in our case. Second, what about Misa Shabbos? Actually doing an action that breaks Shabbos. Now it's questionable here, based on, this, on the uh, various authorities that we quoted, whether processing orders made on Shabbos would constitute a direct benefit um, that was performed for a Jew. We went through this whole thing to explain when the person buys that object, is he really doing it in order so you should make money? Or is he doing it also in a way that, that because you've set it up, that he is acting as your agent, right? He's not acting as your agent. He's doing this for himself. So therefore, it's not an issue of Misa Shabbos. But what about Kenyan Shabbos? About acquiring something on Shabbos. He didn't own it before. Now he owns it on Shabbos and he acquires it. He takes it. Is that allowed? Right? What if it's actually delivered on Shabbos? What if it's something that would, would actually, it would be like um, a, a person orders like for their Kindle. They order a book for their Kindle. It's automatically delivered right to them. And you wrote the book and you make the profit. So is he allowed to do that? As long as one does not specifically arrange for a transaction to happen on Shabbos, he can allow customers to make purchases online during Shabbos. So Therefore, that would be allowed. So where, based on this, would it be forbidden? So where you have a case with eBay, if you have an eBay auction and that auction will end on Shabbos, you have control over this. But if you have, you don't have control if you have a, a buy it now option because a person can go anytime and do it. But if, a, but if you have an auction and you start that auction on Sunday, 
and it's a seven day auction, it'll end on Shabbos. So you have that control. And therefore, in that case, you would not be allowed to do that. You would have to make it that the auction would end on a day other than Shabbos. Now, what about if it had to buy it now, that the person could buy it now at any time? You're making the uh, make it so it ends on Monday. But a guy comes on Friday night and he buys it now. That's allowed. Because there he, he's able to buy it at any time that he wants for himself. That's for him. But you're not setting it up that the only way he can get this is on Shabbos. This can be got, he can get it any time he wants. So therefore, if you, you make an auction on eBay that ends on a Sunday, but it has a buy it now option where someone can buy it now, that's fine. They'll be allowed to do that. What you can't do is to make it that they must do it on Shabbos, that everyone will bid and bid and bid and bid. And then come Friday night at 11.22 at PM, boom, it closes. Somebody bought it on Shabbos. It's the only way they can get it. That you can't do. So in general, not basically, but 90% of the options that we've gone through, you're allowed to do, right? Um, so if that's the case, right, then what, what about, like I, I told you about the example of that, of that um, camera shop. It's a computer and camera shop in New York that takes down their website every Shabbos, that takes down their, their website for all of Pesach, including Cholomoed. So what are they doing? They're following a stricter opinion. Must they? No, they don't have to. Are they, are they, is it laudable? Is it a good thing? Is it a positive thing? 100%. They're showing the world. They're showing their staff. They're showing themselves. But the world itself sees that Jews go, do not put money first. Jews are prepared to not do it in such a way. And therefore, they're allowed um, in that way that what they're doing is laudable. It's a positive thing. Are you required? No, you're not required. But is it a good thing? Yep, it's definitely a good thing. If you came and asked me the question, right, must I do this? I would never tell you you have to. If you came and asked me, is it a good thing? I'd explain the situation and let you decide. It's definitely a good thing to, for the world to see that we do a Kiddush Hashem. We do a positive act for the sake of the world to show that we live our lives based on Torah, not based on making money even if it's permissible, but it, it would smell sort of funny to a person who's not educated. So then let's go the extra mile. But do we have to? Not at all. And, and I will tell you unequivocally, I know as a fact that many of the large businesses that are on Amazon, the Amazon marketplace, they're owned by Orthodox Jews. It was a way for many Jews to work out of home, to be able to spend their time learning Torah or doing other things and still be able to make money. So, be, so internet business is something that is very common in the Orthodox community. And it, is, and, and it is common and allowed as in the way we describe. So with that, we've really come to the conclusion and we've gone over time, so I don't wanna keep you. I do I wanna remind you that next week we will be having this more, I think, controversial discussion over if we're allowed to, is it forbidden? Is it a mitzvah or are we just allowed to turn someone in who is uh, doing some type of criminal activity, be it abuse of their spouse, abuse of a child, sexual abuse, or these types of things, what is our obligation to the community, to the victims, to, to really to the world? Do we, are we required to turn them in? Is it forbidden to turn them in? Or may we choose to? Um, and I think we'll find the, um, some very interesting aspects that will be next Tuesday um, at eight o'clock. So I'll, hopefully I'll look forward to seeing you all and um, we'll take it from there. And of course, um, it's always nice to see everybody. And I hope that the occasion will rise that, that those of you who aren't in shul will start coming to the shul. You know, it's um, with the people being vaccinated and we follow all the rules, I can tell you unequivocally we have had in the last 18 months, five exposures in our shul and absolutely nobody caught it, not one person. Um, so that makes a world of difference. Um, and, and, and people should know, and we look forward to seeing you. So I'll let you go. Thank you for joining me and have a good night. I look forward to seeing you, if not before then next week on Tuesday. Okay, uh, Rabbi, yeah. Rabbi. Sorry to bother you. Can I ask you a question before you log out or should I call you after? You could ask me, but you're asking me and everybody. 
Uh, that's fine. Um, I oh that I don't mind. It's not quite about a website. It's a question not about a website specifically. So I don't, if anyone has a question about a website specifically, feel free to jump in before me. All right. So what's no. Okay. Um, my question is: uh, If you are a Jewish business owner and you have non-Jews work for you, who are contract workers. Um, and th you know that they will very likely work on Shabbat or a Chag. Um, how does that work? So that you have to make a contract with them, where the where the um, the profits the profits and expenses for that day that they um, that they're working for you, be it on Shabbos, belongs to them. And and there's ways of doing it where it, it's not going to destroy your business because you offset it versus the weekdays. So you make an agreement with them. Uh, it's it's a little more complicated than this, but you basically say, okay, um, you know, on Shabbos, all of the profits of the stuff you sell is yours. It's not ours. It's not mine. However, you have to pay expenses for for things that it's my business, right? You'll have to do that. And if you would like, we can make an agreement that I will give you X number of dollars for the work you do on Shabbos for yourself. Um, and maybe it's more, and maybe it's less than you made. But if you agree to that, then we can do that. So there, that's a, the basis of the contract, but you have to make a contract like that. Okay. Okay. Does the contract have, yes, does, thank you. Does the contract have to be with the, the person who you're contracting it, or could it be your non-Jewish business partner that gets the, uh, well, whatever you decide? You have to make a contract with the non-Jewish business partner. Right? Then okay, the so you can have that. You can then the non-Jewish business partner right, would have as a part of his contract that all of the people who are working on Shabbos are working for him. Excellent. Okay. Now, what about a situation like with our company, we have contractors who I know some of them who will be working on Shabbat, like for on a Chag, like I, I know, but there is some contract work. Like if I were to give them a project and say, here's your project and your due date is July 1st. Like I don't necessarily that? know if they're not Jewish, then they can do that. That's like if you you have a, a, a nanny in your house and you tell her, listen, it's Shabbos, we don't use hot water, but she uses hot water to wash the dishes because she's not Jewish. So she's allowed to, because it helps her clean the dishes faster. So she'd be allowed to do that. It's the same idea. Here. I understand. It's the same idea. Yes, except that they're, they're doing a pro but they're doing a project for me and I'm going to get the money and I'm going to pay them whatever but how but some of that money that i might be paying them might be work that was completed on shabbat yeah, i just have no way of knowing asking them to do it it's no different than sending your clothes to a dry cleaner and you if you send your dose to a dry cleaner on friday afternoon and you say you need this on saturday night you're not allowed to do that because they're forcing them to do it on shabbos but if you send it on friday afternoon and tell them you could that you're welcome to give it to back to me on tuesday and they do it on friday night that's their choice even if the dry cleaner is a Jew? No, that would only be if they're they're not Jewish. If they're if they're Jewish, um, well, if they're well, if they're if they're Jewish and you gave that to them, so then um, there there would be different situations and depending on what it is that they had to do. But I'm presuming that most of our discussion is talking about non-Jews. When it comes to talking to Jews, it becomes more complicated, and that we'd have to sit and talk about. Okay, so we might have to sit and talk about that because I do have, you know, one or two staff that do work for me who are Jewish, who are not religious, and I give them projects and I don't know when they okay. complete them. So we'll talk about it. So, okay. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. I appreciate uh, no. you speaking with me. No problem. Have a good night. Thanks. You too. Be well.